first, we will hear from Dafina Stewart. She is a senior vice president and associate general counsel at the Bank Policy Institute. Rebecca Borne is a senior policy counsel at the Center for Responsible Lending. And Chris Cole is an executive vice president and senior regulatory counsel at Independent Community Bankers of America. So we're gonna hear from them in just a second, but just wanted to do a few housekeeping things. First, this is being recorded and will be disseminated later, so just letting folks know. Um, there will be a uh, time for questions at the end. We will be using the Q&A function on Zoom. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A function, not the chat. Um, and keep in mind that uh, people can respond to your chats privately. But if you go to the bottom of your screen, if you're not familiar with the Q&A function, um, you'll see it right next to chat, share screen. You should see Q&A. You can click there and just type in your questions. Um, please feel free to type them in throughout the panel and then we will deal, and then we will um, start answering them at the end. Uh, and I think other than that, we will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dafina. Thanks very much, Ashley. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to have such a wonderful response to this panel. So what I'm going to do is just to level set and to frame the issues that we will be discussing this afternoon, just want to begin by providing some background on ILCs. Um, so ILCs are state chartered institutions and they have nearly all of the same powers as commercial banks. And that includes um, benefits such as FDIC insurance for the deposits they collect. They also have access to the Federal Reserve's discount window and to the Federal Reserve's payment system. These institutions operate under an exception to the Bank Holding Company Act. Um, which allows them to operate their banking business without being subject to comprehensive consolidated supervision by the Federal Reserve that applies to commercial banks. Um, and it's this exception that we colloquially refer to as the ILC loophole uh, that has raised uh, several of the concerns that we will be discussing this afternoon. So there are only five states currently that will charter an ILC. Um, we have California, Hawaii, Minnesota, Nevada, and Utah with the majority of ILCs chartered in Utah. When ILCs were first formed in the early 1900s, they were intended to serve the borrowing needs of low-income industrial workers who were unable to obtain non-collateralized loans uh, from commercial banks. But over time, as states changed their laws and expanded the privileges and authorities that ILCs enjoy, the differences between an ILC and a commercial bank became fewer and fewer until we have the situation we have today, which is that an ILC is virtually indistinguishable from a commercial bank. One unique aspect that you might hear about ILCs is that ILCs of a certain size aren't allowed to accept demand deposits. Um, just wanted to make the point that in some case, in some respects, this is a, a distinction without a difference um, because ILCs are able to offer what are known as negotiable orders of withdrawal to their retail customers, which functionally their transaction accounts that operate a lot like uh, demand deposits. So the public policy concerns about ILCs and the need for congressional action to address the exception in the Bank Holding Company Act through legislation has been discussed for years. Um, as a matter of fact, um, one of the things that I think raised concern is uh, the state of Utah it promotes ILCs as a method for companies to acquire a federally insured bank while avoiding the requirements of federal supervision um, and regulation by the Federal Reserve under the Bank Holding Company Act. So the FDIC in 2006, they did issue a moratorium on applications for deposit insurance um, or acquisition of ILCs and extended that moratorium in 07, specifically with respect to commercial firms owning ILCs. Um, that moratorium expired. And then in 2010, we had the Dodd-Frank Act, um, which included its own moratorium for the period of three years. Um, for insurance, uh, which prohibited the FDIC from granting insurance 
um, applications for ILCs that would have commercial firms as parent companies. And so even though the Dodd-Frank Act moratorium expired in 2013, activity in this space lay dormant um, for, I don't know, the course of almost 15 years. Um, and as Ashley mentioned in her opening remarks, um, the discussion around this was revived and renewed with vigor as a result of approval by the FDIC of applications for Square and Nelnet uh, to ensure ILCs that they chartered in Utah. In addition, also as Ashley mentioned, the FDIC uh, the day after they approved Square and Nelnet issued an NPR um, which was finalized at the end of last year that would codify the practices that the agency used to supervise industrial banks and their parent companies. So under the FDIC's rule, certain commitments and written agreements would be required um, in connection with the FDIC's approval of applications related to ILCs. And you know, the FDIC's rule does only apply to those parent companies of ILCs that are not subject to supervision by the Federal Reserve. In our view though, uh, the FDIC's rule, um, the required commitments, the written agreements, we don't think there are any substitute for consolidated comprehensive supervision by the Federal Reserve, which is the agency that Congress has entrusted with this responsibility. Essentially, we feel that there are still gaps in supervision um, that really can only be addressed by closing this loophole and uh, causing ILC parent companies to come under the supervisory oversight of the Federal Reserve. So with that history, let me turn to my colleague, uh, Rebecca, who's going to kick off our discussion on the detail of some of the concerns that are presented by ILCs. Thank you, Dafina. Hi, everybody. So as Ashley said, I'm with the Center for Responsible Lending. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and policy organization dedicated to building and protecting home ownership and family wealth by supporting fair and inclusive lending and working to eliminate abusive financial practices. We are also an affiliate of Self Help, one of the nation's largest CDFIs. For 40 years, uh, self-help has focused on creating asset building opportunities for low-income, rural, women-led families and families of color, primarily through financing safe and affordable home loans and small business loans. We also have about 70 retail credit unions in North Carolina, California, and several other states, and serve about 150,000 members through those credit unions, through those branches. So my remarks are going to focus on consumer protection concerns posed by ILCs and others will focus on safety and soundness concerns, the mixing of banking and commerce and other risks, which we at CRL generally share. Um, I'd like to start by situating my remarks about ILCs within a broader context. First, we are as as you know, in the midst of an unprecedented health crisis and a severe economic crisis. These crises have wrought disproportionate suffering on black and brown communities because of structural racism that has led to health disparities, lower wealth, lower income, stagnant, wage, stagnant wages, lack of savings, lower credit scores, higher unemployment rates, among other disparities. And while you know, systemic racial barriers persist in virtually every sphere, racist financial policies and practices are among the most well-known and well-documented in the history of racial exclusion. And so as we, as a society, sort of have undertaken and continuing and continue this process of critically um, reevaluating structural racism, we should be scrutinizing closely the effects of financial practices, particularly as they impact black and brown households efforts to achieve financial stability and advancement. Second, um, one of the ways in which low income and particularly black and brown families are exploited and systemic racism is perpetuated and exacerbated is through unaffordable high cost lending. 
uh, these loans, whether they're balloon payment payday loans or car title loans or high cost installment loans that reach rates of about 200% APR are debt traps that lead to a host of harmful consequences for those already struggling financially. You know, overdraft and NSF fees, closed checking accounts, delinquencies on other bills, aggressive debt collection, and more and more research around the psychological distress that these debt traps cause and the impact on physical health um, and so in short, you know, these products leave individuals worse off and drive financial security only further out of reach. Now, one of the most critical protections against these practices is state usury caps. And as many of you may know, most banks, including ILCs, do not generally have to comply with state interest rate limits. But these state laws are vital to protecting consumers from predatory lending by non-banks. At least 45 states have interest rate caps on some consumer loans. For installment loans, the median caps in those states is about 38% APR for smaller loans of like $500, dropping down to about 25% APR for larger loans of say $10,000. So again, most states have meaningful interest rate limits on installment loans made by non-bank lenders. And we do not buy for even an instant that compromising these interest rate limits or relaxing essential consumer protections will promote financial inclusion. Instead, it exploits the inequities resulting from historical discrimination and exacerbates financial exclusion. Um, now, it's long been the case that non-bank financial companies that operate across state lines, whether through brick and mortar or online, adjust their product terms, including their interest rates, to comply with individual states' laws. I'm not saying they love it, but they do it, and they've done it for decades. Um, but with the rise of fintech, there is a growing objection from companies, and you know we focus primarily on lenders, but a growing objection to the notion that they have to comply with state laws. And often, some part of their argument involves financial inclusion. But I want to be clear, lenders have always had to comply with state laws, and they should have to still. Um, banks, of course, get a pass on this generally. But at the same time, traditional banks are subject to robust regulation and supervision at the federal level. And the process of becoming a bank, of buying a bank, and then being a bank has generally been involved and burdensome enough that most financial companies haven't pursued that route, even though it could have gotten them preemption. But that landscape is, of course, shifting. A growing number of non-banks are pursuing bank charters and often for the primary purpose of avoiding state interest rate limits. We saw this with non-bank lenders push for an OCC so-called FinTech charter, which would have given them interest rate preemption. And when that charter got caught up in litigation, predatory lenders set their sights more squarely on a different relatively low-hanging fruit charter, the ILC charter. Um, now, some will argue that the FDIC has the authority and tools to regulate ILCs and their parents as well as the Fed, but this argument just doesn't hold up. Even purely financial companies have shown a strong preference for ILCs over traditional bank charters. When the FDIC proposed its rule last year and approved the two new charters, um, a law firm representing payday and high cost installment lenders said that those FDIC actions suggested that an ILC charter was a viable alternative to the OCC FinTech charter. So the ILC charter was the next charter they wanted, not a traditional bank charter. So to emphasize, entities seeking interest rate preemption will seek ILC charters over traditional bank charters because they want the benefits of a bank charter without the responsibilities stemming from consolidated Fed supervision of their parents. Also on preemption, I want to uh, just touch on con congressional intent. So, you know, since the Great Recession, Congress has only narrowed preemption. Um, preemption played a major role in causing the financial crisis. And so Congress limited national bank interest rate preemption substantially in Dodd-Frank. And it said that even the affiliates, subs, and agents of national banks don't get preemption. So expansion of preemption through additional ILCs for even potentially huge global commercial tech companies is clearly inconsistent with Congress's aim to construe preemption narrowly since 2008. And um, in addition, ILCs 
have been disproportionately involved in predatory lending. A couple of the worst subprime mortgage lenders, GE Capital and Fremont, both ILCs, GMAC, CIT Group also, um, you know, Fremont pumped thousands of toxic mortgages into the market before its parent company filed for bankruptcy in 2008. Um, today, a couple of ILCs, First Electronic Bank and Tab Bank, are engaged in rent-a-bank schemes where they are renting their ILC charters out to predatory non-bank lenders, personify financial and easy pay uh, to make loans up to about 180% APR in a lot of states where those loans would be illegal for the non-bank to do directly. And I should say that um, our position is not that every ILC, every existing ILC, you know, is terrible or predatory, um, but that doesn't change what is an enormous concern, that predatory lenders will look to ILC charters in order to more easily prey upon financially distressed consumers. Um, other panelists, I think, will discuss this further, but ILC charters also open the door to big tech firms having bank charters. Companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, all offer some kind of financial product already today, whether it's directly or through a bank partner. partner. And an ILC could be an attractive option for them. Uh, with the pending application for um, an ILC charter from the e-commerce giant Rakuten, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition has pointed out well some of the risks to consumers posed by bank charters for tech giants. These include privacy risks, you know, big tech could get financial data from their ILC affiliate in ways that the law doesn't contemplate and that pose risks to consumers, fair lending risks posed by the near limitless data and extremely sophisticated algorithms employed by these huge firms, and also uh, undermining the intent of the Community Reinvestment Act. So to wrap up, um, just in conclusion, you know, we see how ILCs pose severe risk to consumers in addition to the concerns that others will highlight here today. And we urge Congress to protect consumers by closing the ILC loophole. And with that, I will turn it over to Chris from ICBA. Thank you, Rebecca, that was very good. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cole, Executive Vice President of the Independent Community Bankers of America who represent the thousands of community banks in the United States. And since 2006, we've opposed, when we opposed Walmart's attempt to establish an ILC, we have always taken the position that commercial companies must not be allowed to own banks or bank-like institutions like ILCs. Banks should act as independent and neutral arbiters of commercial and consumer credit. They should assess risk and create fair access to credit based on their current marketplace, their risk tolerance, and the economic potential of the transaction. And that critical role would be jeopardized if commercial firms were allowed to own or control banks or their functional equivalents like ILCs. And while the new FDIC rules on parent companies of ILCs mitigate to some extent, the safety and soundness concerns regarding ILCs, commercial ownership of ILCs still pose a safety and soundness issue because ILCs will not be able to function as independent credit providers. For instance, there will always be economic incentives for the commercial parent company to deter the ILC subsidiary from lending to a competitor of the parent even though the competitor may be a good loan prospect. Likewise, the ILC bank subsidiary might restrict lending to customers or suppliers of the parent company or only offer favorable terms to these entities. The Glass-Steagall Act and the Bank Holding Company Act separated banking from commerce to prevent undue concentrations of financial and economic power and to minimize conflicts of interest in bank lending and investment advice. A bank that controls or is controlled by a commercial firm has powerful and dangerous incentives to use its lending and investment policies to support its commercial affiliate. Problems that arise in the commercial affiliate are likely to affect the bank as shown by the recent collapse of Wirecard Bank in Germany. In fact, the insolvency of Wirecard exemplifies 
the dangers of combining big tech and banking, which I'll get to shortly, which, which Rebecca uh, touched on. So currently we have Rakuten trying to get an ILC or get deposit insurance uh, approval from the FDIC for an ILC. They've refiled their application. And in the case of a huge e-commerce company like Rakuten, the deep commercial interests of its affiliates would jeopardize the ILC's ability to act independently and without bias towards its customers. Rakuten Bank would always be concerned with how its credit is influencing or affecting the commercial interests of its affiliates. Rakuten Inc., the parent company, would be tempted to direct the bank, its subsidiary, to engage in transactions that benefit the holding company's affiliates, but were detrimental to the ILC's safety and soundness. For instance, Rakuten Inc. could encourage its ILC to deny credit to customers of its affiliates' competitors, or alternatively, could encourage the ILC to offer loans to affiliates' customers based on terms not offered to its competitors' customers. So ICBA has real concerns about big techs generally owning an ILC. Rakuten's bank for in, application, for instance, presents a myriad of privacy and conflict of interest concerns, as Rebecca was talking about. Since Rakuten Bank will be working so closely with its large tech affiliates to reach to market its products, what will happen to Rakuten Bank if there is a serious data breach at one of its affiliates? Would the affiliates be able to, main, to contain the problem so that the ILC would not be seriously impacted? Furthermore, if there was a data breach or other misuse of personal information, would Rakuten's reputation be so adversely affected that the ILC would be seriously impacted? These are the questions the FDIC must seriously assess about Rakuten and any big tech application for an ILC to get deposit insurance. So while this contagion effect is possible in traditional bank holding companies, the concentrated, concentrated business plan of Rakuten Bank tied inextricably to the success of its commercial non-bank tech affiliates make its business prospects very fragile and susceptible to major safety and soundness problems. Like Rakuten, there are many big tech firms that are deeply involved in non-financial commercial activities that no doubt would like to obtain an ILC charter with deposit insurance in order to obtain low cost deposit funding while retaining and expanding their commercial ventures. The integration of these technology and banking firms would not only result in enormous concentration of financial and technological assets, but also would pose significant privacy concerns to our banking system. As shown by China's experience with Ant Financial and with Tencent, big tech firms are likely to gain control of large portions of our financial markets if they acquire ILCs and obtain access to the federal safety net. With Square, Nelnet, and now potentially Rakuten becoming ILCs, we believe it's only a matter of time before other large tech firms like Google and Amazon, Facebook, Apple, apply for an ILC charter, particularly with the legality of the OCC's FinTech charter in question. What will happen when social media giants like Google or Facebook extend their reach into our financial lives? Big data already tracks our movements, our friends and our families and associates, our religious and political affiliations and views and our internet browsing and shopping history. This data is being used for marketing products and services and for targeting marketing uh, political messages. Adding personal financial data like monthly paycheck direct deposits, like account balances, expense patterns, political contributions, history of late fees, transaction records, that would take targeted marketing to a whole new level. Moreover, this financial data could be sold to third-party data aggregators and could be used to discriminate in lending and other financial services. As Karen Shaw Petro has observed, our specific, one specific danger of a company like Amazon getting into finance is the possibility of analytics-based price manipulation. A consumer might try to buy a pair of sneakers and be offered a more expensive pair of sneakers because Amazon knows how much money he or she has. It's watching your payment speed, it's estimating your pain threshold, and all of a sudden it's priority, prioritizing products 
based on what it thinks it knows about what you can afford. So let's talk about the level playing field in banking and how it becomes unlevel with the introduction of ILCs. The ILC loophole is creating this class of banks that will not be subject to the same regulations and restrictions as other regulated entities. Rebecca's already touched on that. On the one hand, you have all these ILCs that are doing exactly the same thing as traditional banks, lending and taking to deposits, but these banks will be owned by various commercial interests, whether it be a tech firm or in the future, a big box store, or maybe even a pharmaceutical company. And none of these entities will be subject to the Bank Holding Company Act or to consolidated regulation as Rebecca would, was referring to. This creates not only an unequal playing field to community banks, because it means they have to compete against these financial firms that are owned by these large commercial interests with every motivation and interest to feed business to their ILCs. ICA, ICBA believes that Rakuten, GM Financial Bank, and all other applicants for deposit insurance through ILC should be subject to the same restrictions and the same supervision that apply to a bank holding company of a simple community bank. The FDIC rules for parent companies of ILCs do not provide the same amount of supervision that bank holding companies are subject to under the Bank Holding Company Act. In conclusion, Congress should close the ILC loophole now. It's been open too long because it threatens the financial system and it creates this very uneven playing field. Now I'll turn it over to Fabrice. Thanks, Chris. I think it's actually me uh, who's up next. No worries, no worries. Um, uh, thank you for that. So I'm going to touch on, uh, you know, consolidated supervision, systemic risk, um, et cetera, that we are we are concerned about with the um, continuing open loophole. Um, before I get to the detail, you know, we've been speaking for the last half hour or so about Congress needs to address this loophole so that ILCs. Um, their parent companies are subject to the Bank Holding Company Act. Um, and one point that I, I failed to mention in my opening remarks is there are ILCs in existence and in business today that are already part of organizations um, that are bank holding companies um, or otherwise subject to Federal Reserve supervision. So when we talk about a lot of the concerns that we have um, around ILCs and parent companies, we are not referring to those. Um, holding companies, we are referring to um, the ones uh, like a square holding company, for example, that is not subject to um, consolidated supervision by the Federal Reserve, um, which leads me into the consolidated supervision, um, the, the gaps that we see there because of the existence of the loophole. As we've been mentioning uh, throughout this presentation, ILCs function essentially the same as commercial banks. And as a result, their holding companies should be subject to the same consolidated supervision, excuse me, by the Federal Reserve um, as, as, um, as bank holding companies are. So when we think about a bank that's a part of a broader organization, you know, it's not sufficient to just focus on the actions and the activities of the bank. We also wanna be sure to consider and pay attention to uh, what's happening in other entities within the organization. Reason being, if there is trouble in one part of the organization, it can very easily and very quickly spread to other parts of the organization, including to the subsidiary insured depository institution, which is why uh, consolidated supervision is important for bank organizations, including those that have uh, chartered ILCs. Supervisors um, will have visibility into all parts of the organization and can effectively manage and address any issues before they pose a danger to the insured institution or to other entities uh, within the organization. As I mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve is uniquely situated among the federal banking agencies with the broad statutory authority 
um, to conduct examinations into the holding company, um, but not only into the holding company, but also into non-bank subsidiaries um, within the organization. Federal Reserve also has a broad enforcement authority, which allows it to prevent or stop activities, um, I'm sorry, stop a holding company or a non-bank affiliate from engaging in unsafe or unsound activities, even if those activities are not directly connected with the uh, subsidiary insured depository institution. While it is true, that the FDIC does have authority to conduct examinations into parent companies of ILCs, that authority is limited. Um, in addition, the FDIC's enforcement authority is limited to unsafe and unsound practices that result um, in the conduct of the ILC's business um, or directly relates to or affects the ILC itself. Um, When um, the other issue of concern that we have when you think about the lack of consolidated supervision relates to financials. Um, the Federal Reserve has the authority to establish consolidated capital and liquidity requirements for bank holding companies. Um, again, you know, thinking about the integrated nature of um, companies today, having capital liquidity requirements at the consolidated level not just for the uh, insured depository institution would help to ensure that the organization is able to uh, support its activities on an enterprise-wide basis. And as I, I believe Chris, you know, spoke a lot about commercial companies that, you know, we currently have a couple of commercial companies that have ILC applications that are pending, but we are also looking down the road to uh, some of the things that he mentioned, a Google, an Amazon, Walmart, perhaps may decide to resubmit an ILC application. Um, you know, but as we see more and more commercial companies and big tech, FinTech companies becoming interested in ILC charters, um, the lack of limitations on and limited supervisory oversight with regards to non-financial activities um, can be concerning. So, you know, contagion risk, um, but also, in terms of the mixing of banking and commerce. Um, Congress imposed laws to maintain the separation of banking and commerce due to concerns that this mixing may make insured depository institutions uh, susceptible to reputational, operational, and financial risks um, of the commercial entities within the organization concentration of economic power concerns. Um, and as Chris mentioned, you know, conflicts of interest when it comes to extension of credit. A commercial, an ILC owned by a commercial firm may decide that it does not want to lend to competitors of its parent organization. There's also the competitive, competitive advantage point, which is um, honestly secondary to kind of the systemic risk um, contagion concerns I just raised, but the ability to engage in uh, unlimited non-financial activities does give ILC parent companies an advantage over other charter types. Uh, they may have a commercial or mixed business models that generate revenues uh, from activities impermissible for commercial banks and uh, bank holding companies. The other point that I wanted to make, especially as we think about the real life example or the real life application rather of Rakuten, which is a Japanese e-commerce company um, that is pending at the FDIC now is that you know, Congress requires the Federal Reserve Board to determine that a foreign bank is subject to comprehensive supervision on a consolidated basis in its home country before the bank can enter into um, the banking business in the United States. And this is because historically there was a situation with a foreign bank parent that was not subject to uh, consolidated supervision, ran into trouble here in the States. Um, and so Congress acted to try to prevent situations like that in the future. But with respect to the ILC charter, there is no such requirement, which would, um, uh, which would then permit a foreign bank that's not subject to consolidated uh, supervision in its home country to evade this requirement. Um, and there would be no single supervisory authority that has visibility into the global activities of an organization and can stamp out an issue before it spread 
um, throughout throughout the organization and possibly into the broader financial system of the countries where that organization does business. So just thinking about historically when the ILC loophole was created uh, with an amendment to the Bank Holding Company Act in 1987, the size the nature, the business activities, the powers of ILCs were limited. They looked very different than the kind of ILCs that you see today that are that are currently um, contemplated or recently chartered. Um, and so, you know, this loophole would permit large national and international uh, commercial firms to acquire an ILC and not have the same supervisory oversight that has been protecting the banking industry. Uh, the banking system um, for so many years. So as many of my colleagues have said on this uh, webinar so far, our ask is for Congress to take action to close the ILC loophole in the Bank Holding Company Act. Our preferred course of action, um, which we think is just the cleanest, would be for them to pass legislation to amend the Bank Holding Company Act to remove that exception. One thing I'll note is, you know, we do recognize <laughs> as I mentioned, that there are many financial institutions that already operate ILCs. And as a result of that, and as a matter of fairness, uh, Congress in acting should ensure that any restrictions on commercial firms that own ILCs uh, do not undermine the ability of existing ILCs to continue to operate their business. Uh, so with that, I think uh, we go back to Ashley at this point. I think you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. Thank you um, for those great presentations. They were very informative. Um, we are going to move to the Q&A portion of the conversation and we'll just jump right in. So, so I think it'd be great if all the panelists could jump back on video. Perfect. So while we're waiting on Chris, Rebecca, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so some might be listening and just think, well, you're just against preemption and that uh, nothing that you're saying is unique, that this is not unique to ILC charters, you're just against it. Um, and you don't really want bank charters for anyone. How would you respond to that? Yeah, um, so I do wanna be clear that we are particularly concerned about ILCs. Um, you know, these are the charters that non-bank lenders that want preemption are after. Um, if they don't think that an OCC FinTech charter will be an option, the Online Lenders Alliance, which represents some grossly predatory lenders, has argued hard for opening up ILC charters. And you know, they say that, oh, the mixing of banking and commerce wouldn't be an issue for their members to become ILCs because they would be financial firms. Um, and so I think that what they're looking for is what they perceive as the easier, less burdensome, most flexible um, charter to get, and they view that as the ILC charter. And so, and so the ILC charter poses particular, you know, kinds of concerns. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and Dafina, so one of the concerns you were talking about um, is the danger of the misuse of customer data. But aren't companies that own ILCs subject to other federal laws that would require them to protect the data of their customers? And does the FDIC rule have any provisions for consumer data, privacy, and, secure, and security? Sure. sure. So maybe I'll take that the last piece first um, with respect to the FDIC rule. One of the changes that the FDIC made going from its NPR to its final rule um, was to add to its annual reporting requirements uh, a requirement that uh, the ILC inform the FDIC, I'm just reading it to be clear, um, inform the FDIC about its systems for uh, protecting the security, confidentiality, and integrity of consumer and uh, non-public personal information. Uh, so basically they're saying, tell us what you're doing, we'll monitor to make sure that you're you know, keeping up with your, um, your obligations. In terms of other uh, federal laws that might protect consumer data, and, and I go back to the first point that I made, you know, we are trying to close gaps. So, you know, potentially there are, you know, some state privacy laws that I think would apply here. Um, and there might be some federal laws that would apply, but they, they wouldn't form the same, um, you know, simple, 
federal financial privacy um, umbrella, let's call it, that a company would be subject to if they were uh, under the umbrella of Federal Reserve supervision under the BHCA, the Bank Holding Company Act. Thank you. Uh, Chris, so what, um, in terms of the consolidated supervision issue, what activities or powers can an ILC engage in that other banks can't? Um, what responsibilities do they have to the Fed um, that ILCs don't that facilitate the behavior we've been talking about? Well, the biggest issue and the reason why you want uh, these entities to be subject to uh, consolidated supervision and Bank Holding Company Act, of course, is this commercial uh, business. In other words, these companies are trying to evade Bank Holding Company Act restrictions, which restrict the holding company to only activities that are closely related to, to banking. And uh, so a commercial company can own an ILC and still engage in commercial activities. It can engage in, in you know, it can be Walmart, it can be uh, Target, and it can engage in its commercial activities and still be, uh, uh, still own an ILC. So that's the, the, the biggest thing that, that, the biggest issue that we have with ILCs. Now you also raise the whole question of consolidated regulation. If you're subject to consolidated regulation, and here's the key thing that I want everyone to remember, what, what happens then is the Federal Reserve examines the parent company for capital adequacy, for liquidity. It restricts the parent company in all respects with respect to its transactions with, with its affiliate ILC. Now the FDIC tries to replicate, tried to replicate that with its its own restrictions, and they and they tried and they and they and they you know came up say with fifty percent of that, but not quite. Consolidated supervision, you, you can have all the agreements in the world with the parent company, but unless you are subject to something like consolidated supervision, where the 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 agency is actually parking itself and examining that parent company and is subject to all those restrictions that the bank holding company applies, that's the only way to get that parent company to that will be in compliance with all the regulations of the bank holding company act, all those, all those restrictions on capital, on liquidity, on, on its transactions with affiliates, all of that, you need the consolidated supervision to do it and you lack it when you have a system that the FDIC is trying to impose on ILCs. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I, I think so, thank you. <laughs> um, so we also had a question in the chat. Um, what do you think about the provisioning of financial services by the partnership between a properly regulated national bank and a big tech? Um, like for instance, the partnership that Googleplex is launching currently with some U.S. banks. Wondering if Dafina, you wanted to take that one. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm actually rereading the question now. <laughs> if you don't mind. So yeah, this is this is definitely something that um, we've been monitoring with you know fintechs uh, partnering with banks, and I, I think maybe in that instance there might not be as much concern because you do have the regulated bank um, that kind of serves as a uh, a safety, let's say, um, for any 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 concerning activities by the fintech such as a, a Googleplex. Um, that might be in partnership with the, the regulated bank. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else want to add anything to that? All right, um, so we're going to keep going. So um, how would you respond to the view that 
Dafina, this is another one for you. Your constituents are simply against charter choice and innovation in the banking space because um, it will lead to increased competition with commercial traditional banks. And that's the reason um, you're asking Congress to impose um, additional limitations. Thank you. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think, you know, we are definitely in favor of charter choice um, and 100% in favor of banks innovating and finding uh, new ways to serve the needs of their customers. Um, but just to be really clear about it, we don't think that innovation should come at the potential cost of um, safety and soundness or some of the other risks that we have um, that we have mentioned here. And, and we're not we're not advocating for the elimination of the ILC charter. The ILC charter could very well could still continue to exist. What we are advocating for is to put the consolidated organization under the same kind of uh, supervision that applies to other institutions that are doing the sim same kind of business as an ILC is, is doing. Yeah, I might add, Ashley, uh, that neither BPI nor ICBA, for instance, that has opposed um, other fintechs getting a traditional bank, bank charter, such as Vero Bank. Um, uh, just recently, SoFi is trying to get into the banking business by acquiring a bank, and um, and they're doing it the right way. I mean, they're they're going to be subject to the Bank Holding Company Act. They're going to be subject to Class D Act. All the re all the regulations that uh, that um, owners of community banks and large banks uh, are subject to. So uh, I don't think that any of the trades are taking the position that they're that fintechs uh, shouldn't be allowed to uh, to get into the banking business. It's just uh, we we oppose using this loophole to do it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Rebecca, anything you wanted to add there? Okay. Um, so Chris, I'm keeping on you for a second. So the ILC industry points out that there have been few failures of ILCs. If that's true, then aren't they safe and sound? Yeah, you know, they, they've taken that position and I've, I've, several of them have approached me and said, listen, our industry is very safe. But, but when you look at the record, while it's true that during the crisis of 2007, 2009, we two small, only two small ILCs failed. Uh, one in Nevada, and one in Utah. But the truth is that the federal government also bailed out many large corporate owners of ILCs. And that included GE Capital, included CIT, it included Goldman Sachs, it included Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley. So I would maintain that the track record of ILCs has not been that good. Furthermore, if you want to see what happens when a bank affiliate fails because of the insolvency of a big affiliated tech company, I would like, I would refer all of you to the problem of Wirecard in Germany. They are having a devil of a time with, with trying to deal with the insolvency of Wirecard and its banking affiliate. And uh, I think that's an excellent example of why you don't want big tech commercial companies owning uh, a banks. Thank you, thank you, Chris. And so I wanna talk a little bit more about just the landscape that we're in. So Rebecca, do you think that, you know, expected changes to the composition of, of, of the FDIC board over the next couple of months due to new appoint, appointees at the CFPB and soon the OCC mean that it will be less open to new ILC charters? So Congress doesn't need to act in this area? So I think we certainly urge the OCC, I mean, sorry, the FDIC, um, you know, not to approve any additional ILC charters. Um, but it is also really past time for Congress to act. Um, you know, I mean, as I think Dafina pointed out, ILCs as they are envisioned being used today by these huge national or international companies um, are really inconsistent with what ILCs sort of, you know, began as and, and were even when their exemption from the um, Bank Holding Company Act was, um, was passed. And so um, we think it's much better for Congress to take care of it. Um, 
instead of you know leaving it to the regulators and all of the uncertainty that goes along with that. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, so on the landscape, you know, I think there's been a lot of mention of big tech companies and other giant companies. Chris, do you really think Walmart wants to own an ILC or get into banking? Yeah, I do. I, I, well, they just hired a big shot Goldman Sachs um, uh, employee, former employee, uh, to head their banking division. Uh, uh, they're already, of course, uh, doing a lot of banking through Green Dot. I think it's a matter of time before they'll go back and they'll apply for an ILC charter. I, I, I really do. I think they will, they will be uh, involved in, in banking very, very soon. And I'm expecting that uh, they might even do that in response to, uh, to an Amazon or to a Google. I think we're going to see a lot more uh, big tech and big box stores interested in banking. So with this pending or this this on the horizon and with Rebecca's last comments, does anyone want to take the question of why Congress has seemingly been unwilling to close this so-called loophole? To close this loophole, as we call it. I, I'll take that. I, one, of the, one of the problems has been just um, um, educating them about the dangers of this loophole. And you know, at, at 15 years ago, when Walmart got into it, we came close to getting some legislative action, and we got, in fact, Dodd Frank, and Dodd Frank imposed a moratorium on I, on uh, ILCs. Um, the reason why we we don't have that kind of attention now is, I think, because we don't have the Walmart that we had 15 or 16 years ago. But we now have Rakuten, and I think Rakuten is this big e-commerce company. And I think as as soon as the Hill realizes, I, I think as soon as our legislators realize how serious that this precedent will will be once Rakuten gets an ILC, then I think uh, we'll get some action with with ILCs. I'm already seeing some interest right now over on the Senate side. Uh, and, uh, you know, last in last session, we had Senator Kennedy drop a bill to close the ILC and never got very far in the uh, Senate Banking Committee. But now I'm hearing uh, uh, some more interest in trying to close this loophole. And, and so I think I think this uh, this year will be the, the year where action will be taken. Very encouraging, Chris. Um, one more question for you, Rebecca. Um, uh, we had a question about, since IOCs are state chartered, how can they evade state use recaps? You're on mute. Sorry. Um, so state chartered banks are, sub are subject to the usury cap of the state in which they are chartered, but because of provisions in the Federal Dep Deposit Insurance Act and, and other related provisions, um, they can effectively charge whatever the cap of their home state is in every other state. And so in reality, their interest rate preem preemption privileges are really similar to national bank preemption privileges. And that's why we see a lot of state charter banks chartered in, in Utah um, and other states that don't have um, very, uh, you know, strict interest rate limits that apply to banks. Thanks, Rebecca. So we only have a few minutes left. Um, I think we've got a lot of great information today. I just want to open it up um, one last time to any of the panelists. If there's any final thoughts you want to share that you didn't get to cover today, a question that you were just dying to answer that didn't come up and you think is really important for the audience to know the answer to. Just um, uh, one thing, I noticed two or three questions, they were directed to, to me uh, here about why I think the Fed could do a better job regulating than FDIC and do I favor the Fed over the FDIC? No, that's not where, where we're coming from with this. What the point of my argument is that when you have a commercial company owning a bank, 
it doesn't matter who the regulator is, whether it was the FDIC or anyone else, there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues. And that's what the FDIC is trying to tackle now. They're trying to come up with ways to regulate a commercial parent company. I'm not criticizing FDIC. They're a great institution, wonderful regulator, but I think they're getting way over their head when they try to, uh, to regulate an entity like Rakuten, and they certainly would be way over their head if they tried to regulate Amazon or Google or any of the big tech firms that wanted to get in and own an ILC. We can only imagine. Um, any other thoughts, Rebecca or Davina? They covered it all. Um, well, we really want to thank everyone for coming out. We have been recording this. We'll disseminate the recording as well as some follow-up materials to everyone who attended and for those who weren't able to attend and RSVP'd. Um, feel free to send any questions by follow-up email. And um, we look forward to working with many of you to, to close this loophole and protect consumers and the banking system. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.